Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution published July 1905. Chapter 13. Conclusion. Dare we win? People who are superficially acquainted with the state of affairs in Russian social democracy, or who judge as mere onlookers without knowing the whole history of our internal party struggle since the days of economism, very often also dismiss the disagreements on tactics which have now become crystallized, especially after the Third Congress, with the page 157 of the MS simple argument that there are two natural, inevitable and quite reconcilable trends in every social democratic movement. One side they say, lays special emphasis on the ordinary, current, everyday work, on the necessity of developing propaganda and agitation, of preparing forces, deepening the movement, etc., while the other side lays emphasis on the militant, general political, revolutionary tasks of the movement, points to the necessity of armed insurrection, advances the slogans, for a revolutionary democratic dictatorship, for a provisional revolutionary government. Neither one side nor the other should exaggerate. They say, extremes are bad, both here and there, and, generally speaking, everywhere in the world, etc., etc. The cheap truisms of worldly, and political in quotation marks, wisdom, which such arguments undoubtedly contain, too often cover up a failure to understand the urgent and acute needs of the party. Take the differences on tactics that now exist among the Russian Social Democrats. Of course, the special emphasis laid on the everyday, routine aspect of the work, such as we observe in the newest RIST arguments about tactics, could not in itself present any danger and could not give rise to any divergence of opinion regarding tactical slogans. But the moment you compare the resolutions of the Third Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party with the resolutions of the conference this divergence becomes strikingly obvious. What, then, is the trouble? The trouble is that, in the first place, it is not enough to point abstractly to the two currents in the movement and to the harmfulness of extremes. One must know concretely what the given movement is suffering from at the given time, what constitutes the real political danger to the party at the present time. Secondly, one must know what real political forces are profiting by this or that tactical slogan, or perhaps by the absence of this or that slogan. To listen to the newest Scruists, one would arrive at the conclusion that the Social Democratic Party is threatened with the danger of throwing overboard propaganda and agitation, the economic struggle and criticism of bourgeois democracy, of becoming inordinately absorbed in military preparations, armed attacks, the seizure of power, etc. Actually, however, real danger is threatening the party from an entirely different quarter. Anyone who is at all closely familiar with the state of the movement, anyone who follows it carefully and thoughtfully, cannot fail to see the ridiculous side of the newest res fears. The entire work of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party has already been fully moulded into firm, immutable forms which absolutely guarantee that our main attention will be fixed on propaganda and agitation, impromptu and mass meetings, on the distribution of leaflets and pamphlets, assisting in the economic struggle and championing the slogans of that struggle. There is not a single party committee, not a single district committee, not a single central delegates meeting or a single factory group where 99% of all the attention, energy and time are not always and constantly devoted to these functions, which have become firmly established ever since the middle of the 90s. Only those who are entirely unfamiliar with the movement are ignorant of this. Only very naive or ill-informed people can be taken in by the newest realists' repetition of stated truths when it is done with an air of great importance. The fact is that not only is no excessive zeal displayed among us with regard to the tasks of insurrection, to the general political slogans and to the matter of leading the entire popular revolution, but, on the contrary, it is backwardness in this very respect that stands out most strikingly, constitutes our weakest spot and a real danger to the movement, which may degenerate, and in some places is degenerating, from one that is revolutionary in deeds into one that is revolutionary in words. Among the many, many hundreds of organizations, groups and circles that are conducting the work of the party you will not find a single one which has not from its very inception conducted the kind of everyday work about which the wiseacres of the new Iskra now talk with the air of people who have discovered new truths. On the other hand, you will find only an insignificant percentage of groups and circles that have understood the tasks an armed insurrection entails, which have begun to carry them out and have realized the necessity of leading the entire popular revolution against Tsarism.
the necessity of advancing for that purpose certain definite progressive slogans and no other. We are incredibly behind in our progressive and genuinely revolutionary tasks, in very many instances we have not even become conscious of them, here and there we have failed to notice the strengthening of revolutionary bourgeois democracy owing to our backwardness in this respect. But the writers in the new Iskra, turning their backs on the course of events and on the requirements of the times, keep repeating insistently, don't forget the old. Don't let yourselves be carried away by the new. This is the principal and unvarying leitmotif of all the important resolutions of the conference, whereas in the Congress resolutions you just as unvaryingly read, while confirming the old, and without stopping to chew it over and over, for the very reason that it is old and has already been settled and recorded in literature, in resolutions and by experience, we put forward a new task, draw attention to it, issue a new slogan and demand that the genuinely revolutionary social democrats immediately set to work to put it into effect. That is how matters really stand with regard to the question of the two trends in social democratic tactics. The revolutionary period has called forth new tasks, which only the totally blind can fail to see. And some social democrats unhesitatingly recognize these tasks and place them on the order of the day, declaring, the armed insurrection brooks no delay prepare yourselves for it immediately and energetically. Remember that it is indispensable for a decisive victory. Issue the slogans of a republic, of a provisional government, of a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Others, however, draw back, mark time, write prefaces instead of giving slogans, instead of pointing to the new while confirming the old, they chew this old tediously and at great length, inventing pretexts to avoid the new, unable to determine the conditions for a decisive victory or to issue the slogans which alone are in line with the striving to attain complete victory. The political result of this kvostism stares us in the face. The fable about a rapprochement between the majority of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and the revolutionary bourgeois democracy remains a fable which has not been confirmed by a single political fact, by a single important resolution of the Bolsheviks or a single act of the Third Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. On the other hand, the opportunist, monarchist bourgeoisie, as represented by the Osvobos de Nii, has long been welcoming the trends of the principles of new Iskrism and now it is actually running its mill with their grist, is adopting their catchwords and ideas directed against secrecy and riots, against exaggerating the technical side of the revolution, against openly proclaiming the slogan of armed insurrection, against the revolutionism of extreme demands, etc., etc. The resolution of a whole conference of Menshevik social democrats in the Caucasus, and the endorsement of that resolution by the editors of the new Iskra, sums it all up politically in an unmistakable way, lest the bourgeoisie recoil if the proletariat takes part in a revolutionary democratic dictatorship. This puts it in a nutshell. This gives the finishing touch to the transformation of the proletariat into an appendage of the monarchist bourgeoisie. The political meaning of the kvostism of the new Iskra is thereby proved in fact, not by a casual declaration of some individual, but by a resolution especially endorsed by a whole trend. Anyone who ponders over these facts will understand the real significance of the stock reference to the two sides and the two trends in the social democratic movement. For a study of these trends on a large scale, takes Bernsteinism. The Bernsteinians have been dinning into our rears in exactly the same way that it is they who understand the true needs of the proletariat, the tasks connected with the growth of its forces, with rendering the entire activity more profound, with preparing the elements of a new society, with propaganda and agitation. Bernstein says, we demand a frank recognition of what is, thus sanctifying a movement without final aims, sanctifying defensive tactics only, preaching the tactics of fear lest the bourgeoisie recoil. The Bernsteinians also raised an outcry against the Jacobinism of the revolutionary social democrats, against the publicists who fail to understand the initiative of the workers, etc., etc. In reality, as everyone knows, the revolutionary social democrats have never even thought of abandoning the everyday, petty work, the mustering of forces, etc., etc. All they demanded was a clear understanding of the fine lame, a clear presentation of the revolutionary tasks. They wanted to raise the semi-proletarian and semi-petty bourgeois strata to the revolutionary level of the proletariat, not to reduce this level to that of opportunist considerations such as lest the bourgeoisie recoil. Perhaps the most vivid expression of this rift between the intellectual opportunist wing and the proletarian revolutionary wing of the party was the question, 
Sturf and Wasichan? Dare we win? Is it permissible for us to win? Would it not be dangerous for us to win? Or we to win? This question, which seems so strange at first sight, was raised, however, and had to be raised, because the opportunists were afraid of victory, were frightening the proletariat away from it, were predicting that trouble would come of it, were ridiculing the slogans that straightforwardly called for it. The same fundamental division into an intellectual opportunist and proletarian revolutionary trend exists also among us, with the very material difference, however, that here we are faced with the question of a democratic revolution, and not of a socialist revolution. The question dare we win? Which seems so absurd at first sight, has been raised among us also. It was raised by Martinov in his two dictatorships, in which he prophesied dire misfortune if we prepare well for and carry out an insurrection quite successfully. The question has been raised in all the newer scroll literature dealing with a provisional revolutionary government, and all the time persistent though futile efforts have been made to liken Milleran's participation in a bourgeois opportunist government to Valen's one, participation in a petty bourgeois revolutionary government. It is embodied in a resolution lest the bourgeoisie recoil. And although Kautsky, for instance, now tries to wax ironical and says that our dispute about a provisional revolutionary government is like dividing the skin of a bear before the bear has been killed, this irony only proves that even clever and revolutionary social democrats are liable to put their foot in it when they talk about something they know of only by hearsay. German social democracy is not yet so near to killing its bear, carrying out a socialist revolution. But the dispute as to whether we dare kill the bear was of enormous importance from the point of view of principles and of practical politics. Russian social democrats are not yet so near to being strong enough to kill their bear, to carry out a democratic revolution, but the question as to whether we dare kill it is of extreme importance for the whole future of Russia and for the future of Russian social democracy. An army cannot be energetically and successfully mustered and led unless we are sure that we dare win. Take our old economists. They too howled that their opponents were conspirators. Jacobins, see the Rebochai Dialio, especially number 10, and Martinov's speech in the debate on the program at the Second Congress, that by plunging into politics they were divorcing themselves from the masses, that they were losing sight of the fundamentals of the working class movement, ignoring the initiative of the workers, etc., etc. In reality these supporters of the initiative of the workers were opportunist intellectuals who tried to foist on the workers their own narrow and philistine conception of the tasks of the proletariat. In reality the opponents of economism, as everyone can see from the old Iskra, did not neglect or push into the background any of the aspects of social democratic work. Nor did they in the least forget the economic struggle, but they were able at the same time to present the urgent and immediate political tasks in their full scope and they opposed the transformation of the Workers' Party into an economic appendage of the liberal bourgeoisie. The economists had learned by rote that politics are based on economics and understood this to mean that the political struggle should be reduced to the level of the economic struggle. The newest greyists have learned by rote that the economic basis of the democratic revolution is the bourgeois revolution and understood this to mean that the democratic aims of the proletariat should be degraded to the level of bourgeois moderation, to the limits beyond which the bourgeoisie will recoil. On the pretext of rendering their work more profound, on the pretext of rousing the initiative of the workers and pursuing a purely class policy, the economists were actually delivering the working class into the hands of the liberal bourgeois politicians, that is, were leading the party along a path which objectively meant exactly that. On the same pretexts, the new Iskraists are actually betraying the interests of the proletariat in the democratic revolution to the bourgeoisie, that is, are leading the party along a path which objectively means exactly that. The economists thought that leadership in the political struggle was no concern of the social democrats but properly the business of the liberals. The new Iskraists think that the active conduct of the democratic revolution is no concern of the social democrats but properly the business of the democratic bourgeoisie, for, they argue. If the proletariat takes the leading and preeminent part it will diminish the sweep of the revolution. In short, the new Iskraists are the epigons of economism, not only in their origin at the Second Party Congress, but also in the manner in which they now present the tactical tasks of the proletariat in the democratic revolution. They, too, constitute an intellectual opportunist wing of the party. In the sphere of organization they made their debut with the anarchist individualism of intellectuals and finished with disorganization as a process, fixing in the rules, too, 
the rules of organization adopted at the Geneva Menshevik Conference in 1905, adopted by the conference the separation of the party's publishing activities from the party organization, an indirect and practically four-stage system of elections, a system of bonapartist plebiscites instead of democratic representation, and finally the principle of agreements between the part and the whole. In party tactics they continued to slide down the same inclined plane. In the plan of the Zemstvo campaign they declared that speeches to Zemstvoists were the highest type of demonstration, finding only two active forces on the political scene, on the eve of January 9. The government and the democratic bourgeoisie. They made the pressing problem of arming more profound by substituting for the direct and practical slogan of an appeal to arm. The slogan, arm the people with a burning desire to arm themselves. The tasks connected with an armed insurrection, with the establishment of a provisional government and with a revolutionary democratic dictatorship have now been distorted and blunted by them in their official resolutions. Lest the bourgeoisie recoil this final chord of their last resolution throws a glaring light on the question of where their path is leading the party. The democratic revolution in Russia is a bourgeois revolution by reason of its social and economic content. But a mere repetition of this correct Marxian proposition is not enough. It must be properly understood and properly applied in political slogans. In general, all political liberties that are founded on present day, that is, capitalist, relations of production are bourgeois liberties. The demand for liberty expresses primarily the interests of the bourgeoisie. Its representatives were the first to raise this demand. Its supporters have everywhere used the liberty they acquired like masters, reducing it to moderate and meticulous bourgeois doses, combining it with the most subtle methods of suppressing the revolutionary proletariat in peaceful times and with brutally cruel methods in stormy times. But only the rebel Narodniks, the anarchists and the economists could deduce from this that the struggle for liberty should be rejected or disparaged. These intellectual Philistine doctrines could be foisted on the proletariat only for a time and against its will. The proletariat always realized instinctively that it needed political liberty, needed it more than anyone else, despite the fact that its immediate effect would be to strengthen and to organize the bourgeoisie. The proletariat expects to find its salvation not by avoiding the class struggle but by developing it, by widening it, increasing its consciousness, its organization and determination. Whoever degrades the tasks of the political struggle transforms the social democrat from a tribune of the people into a trade union secretary. Whoever degrades the proletarian tasks in a democratic bourgeois revolution transforms the social democrat from a leader of the people's revolution into a leader of a free labor union. Yes, the people's revolution. Social democracy has fought, and is quite rightly fighting against the bourgeois democratic abuse of the word people. It demands that this word shall not be used to cover up failure to understand the class antagonisms within the people. It insists categorically on the need for complete class independence for the party of the proletariat. But it divides the people into classes, not in order that the advanced class may become shut up within itself, confine itself to narrow aims and emasculate its activity for fear that the economic rulers of the world will recoil, but in order that the advanced class, which does not suffer from the half-heartedness, vacillation and indecision of the intermediate classes, may with all the greater energy and enthusiasm fight for the cause of the whole of the people, at the head of the whole of the people. That is what the present-day new Israelists so often fail to understand and why they substitute for active political slogans in the democratic revolution a mere pedantic repetition of the word class, parsed in all genders and cases. The democratic revolution is a bourgeois revolution. The slogan of a black redistribution, or land and liberty this most widespread slogan of the peasant masses, downtrodden and ignorant, yet passionately yearning for light and happiness, is a bourgeois slogan. But we Marxists should know that there is not, nor can there be, any other path to real freedom for the proletariat and the peasantry, than the path of bourgeois freedom and bourgeois progress. We must not forget that there is not, nor can there be, at the present time, any other means of bringing socialism nearer, than complete political liberty, than a democratic republic, than the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. As the representatives of the advanced and only revolutionary class, revolutionary without reservations, doubts or looking back, we must present to the whole of the people, as widely, as boldly and with the utmost initiative possible, the tasks of the democratic revolution.
To degrade these tasks in theory means making a travesty of Marxism, distorting it in Philistine fashion, while in practical politics it means delivering the cause of the revolution into the hands of the bourgeoisie, which will inevitably recoil from the task of consistently carrying out the revolution. The difficulties that lie on the road to the complete victory of the revolution are very great. No one will be able to blame the representatives of the proletariat if, having done everything in their power, their efforts are defeated by the resistance of the reaction, the treachery of the bourgeoisie and the ignorance of the masses. But everybody and the class-conscious proletariat above all, will condemn social democracy if it curtails the revolutionary energy of the democratic revolution and dampens revolutionary ardor because it is afraid to win, because it is actuated by the consideration, lest the bourgeoisie recoil. Revolutions are the locomotives of history, said Marx. 3. In the class struggles in France, revolutions are the festivals of the oppressed and the exploited. At no other time are the masses of the people in a position to come forward so actively as creators of a new social order as at a time of revolution. At such times the people are capable of performing miracles, if judged by the narrow, Philistine scale of gradual progress. But the leaders of the revolutionary parties must also make their aims more comprehensive and bold at such a time, so that their slogans shall always be in advance of the revolutionary initiative of the masses serve as a beacon, reveal to them our democratic and socialist ideal in all its magnitude and splendor and show them the shortest and the most direct route to complete, absolute and decisive victory. Let us leave to the opportunists of the Osvobos de Nii bourgeoisie the task of inventing roundabout, circuitous paths of compromise out of fear of the revolution and of the direct path. If we are compelled by force to drag ourselves along such paths, we shall be able to fulfill our duty in petty, everyday work also. But let ruthless struggle first decide the choice of the path. We shall be traitors to and betrayers of the revolution if we do not use this festive energy of the masses and their revolutionary ardor to wage a ruthless and self-sacrificing struggle for the direct and decisive path. Let the bourgeois opportunists contemplate the future reaction with craven fear. The workers will not be frightened either by the thought that the reaction promises to be terrible or by the thought that the bourgeoisie proposes to recoil. The workers are not looking forward to striking bargains, and not asking for sops, they are striving to crush the reactionary forces without mercy, that is, to set up the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Of course, greater dangers threaten the ship of our party in stormy times than in periods of the smooth sailing of liberal progress, which means the painfully slow sweating of the working class by its exploiters. Of course. The tasks of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship are a thousand times more difficult and more complicated than the tasks of an extreme opposition or of the exclusively parliamentary struggle. But whoever can deliberately prefer smooth sailing and the path of safe opposition in the present revolutionary situation had better abandon social democratic work for a while, had better wait until the revolution is over, until the festive days have passed when humdrum everyday life starts again and his narrow routine standards no longer strike such an abominably discordant note, or constitute such an ugly distortion of the tasks of the advanced class. At the head of the whole of the people, and particularly of the peasantry, for complete freedom, for a consistent democratic revolution, for a republic. At the head of all the toilers and the exploited, for socialism. Such must in practice be the policy of the revolutionary proletariat, such is the class slogan which must permeate and determine the solution of every tactical problem, every practical step of the workers' party during the revolution.